All right. Uh, so we're very pleased today uh, to have William O'Neill, the designated expert of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, on Haiti. Uh, he will speak to you about a report that's been released today on the human rights situation uh, in Haiti. So he will make some opening remarks and then we will take a few questions. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good to be with you. Thank you all for coming and for your interest in Haiti. Um, the High Commissioner of Human Rights this morning in the press release that accompanied the report used the word apocalyptic to describe the human rights situation in Haiti. I would totally agree with that. Uh, pick your adjective, uh, catastrophic, and uh, is another word that comes to mind. Uh, I worked with the UN first UN mission in Haiti, uh, MISIVI, in 1993 and 94, 95, and we had at that point a military dictatorship that had just overthrown an elected president. And we were documenting executions, disappearances, torture, rape, a total crackdown on civil society and the media. Uh, I've, it's much worse now. I have to say it's much worse now than it was then. I've talked to Haitians who remember the Duvalier dictatorship, both father and son, Francois and Jean-Claude. Uh, they say it's much worse than under Duvalier. Uh, that really is saying something. The report, you'll see, uh, it, it, it illustrates many cases. You heard earlier this today, in the previous session, some statistics from the uh, humanitarian agencies uh, that are quite frightening, terrifying, but also can be numbing at some point. Uh, the numbers are all going very much in the wrong direction very quickly. Uh, the human rights team in, in Port-au-Prince has done a fantastic job in very challenging circumstances to gather information, even before the last few weeks, where we've seen a real increase in violence and danger, literally in moving around. Uh, nevertheless, they were able to document and confirm all too many cases, again, of killings, of kidnappings, of actually stop trying to count the cases of sexual violence and abuse because they know whatever number they had would be so drastically below the reality that would be very misleading to even give any number to give you the extent of the, of the problem, of that, of that terrible, terrible use of, by the gangs. Again, the violence is all from the gangs and the gangs use sexual violence to terrorize, to intimidate, to control. Uh, and it's a power, and it's, it's just horrendous, and there's very, very limited services for the survivors and victims of these attacks. I just want to highlight three um, developments that were identified in the report, in addition to going through the different cases and the confirmation of all the, the violations and abuses that had occurred, have occurred over the last few months. Um, one development is that the recent violence, and by this I mean the last four to five weeks especially, uh, we see a, a dar targeting of key institutions and individuals in Haiti uh, that are, are very alarming. Uh, before, it wasn't that it was random violence, but if it, it was more if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time at a gang checkpoint or in an area between two gangs fighting over territory. What's happened recently is attacks specifically on hospitals. Uh, over 18 have been documented. There, are, I think, barely half the hospitals in Port-au-Prince now function, and if the ones that are functioning barely, uh, you have attacks on schools. Uh, it was early, I mentioned earlier, a uh, school was set on fire three days ago. I just learned this morning they call uh, they, they call Normal, which is one of the the elite academic institutions in Haiti, was set on fire last night. You have an attack on the central bank offices. You had two attempts to take the National Palace. You have human rights uh, defenders and journalists being targeted. So this is extremely alarming. The gangs have turned their violence uh, towards people that for whatever reasons they see as a threat to their continued control of, of the territories they control. The second very alarming element that's been, that's been documented by the human rights team in Binu is increasing use of children by the gangs, um, not only as messengers or lookouts, uh, and in some cases with young girls, they're sex slaves and cooks. Uh, you actually have young, uh, Teenagers now involved so-called frontline activities in, in, in violence, in attacks uh, that we did not see before, at least in such numbers. And then the third element, and this is something it's been foreshadowed, what I just said, what was said earlier this morning, there's a direct, it's a direct causation. A surge in violence means a surge in malnutrition. And you see the WFP statistics. Haiti is now 1.5 million. Uh, the different gradations of closeness to famine that the uh, WFP uses. Haiti is many, many, uh, 1.5 million Haitians are in a very, very vulnerable food, uh, precarious situation. You see a surge in IDPs, 
people having to flee their homes because of the violence. When I went to Haiti in uh, the first time last July, the IOM gave me a figure of 50,000 IDPs. When I was there in October, November, on my second mission, it was 200,000. And now the number is at least 362,000. And I would say, given the last three to four weeks, we're probably close to 400,000, if not over that. So you can see the amazingly intensified surge in IDPs and people fleeing. And when they flee, they are really vulnerable. There are very few services, very little bit ways to protect the displaced, and especially young girls and women are at great risk. Um, schools, hospitals, um, key government institutions, everything now is at risk. I say Port-au-Prince and the surrounding area is essentially an open air prison. There's no way out, air, land, or sea. And in fact, it's not even so open air anymore because people are often afraid to leave their houses. Literally leaving their house to go to a market if it's open is a life and threatening uh, adventure for them. And, and it's not like a lot of Haitians have huge refrigerators or stockpiles of food. Most Haitians have to go out every day and buy just enough food if they can afford it and find it to get through that day. Uh, so it's not really an option to stay in your house for very long. So they have to verge, uh, go outside and venture outside. That is extremely dangerous. So I'll stop there because I know you probably have, a, I hope you have a lot of questions and comments. And I'll be t happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Anade? Uh, thank you very much. On behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association, thank you very much for this brief. My name is Anani Satima from Al Jazeera English. So I'd like to start, I suppose, with the first of the key developments, the attacks on institutions, particularly democratic institutions. Obviously, you've talked about the attacks, but can you talk a little bit about what would be necessary to reinstate the institutions? So how do you go back to a situation where Haitians do have human rights and access to these situ institutions, given the context? Sure, thank you very much. I mean, the key, the key number one overriding issue is security. Um, it's, it's got to be established to some minimal level. It is now non-existent in almost all of the capital and the surrounding area, and then also over into Carrefour and the Central Plain. Um, also in the lower Artibonite Valley, which is the breadbasket, Haiti is only barely, not even half self-sufficient in food. It used to be 100%, but over the years it's fallen quite a lot, so imports are crucial. The Artibonite Valley produces a huge proportion of whatever food is produced in Haiti. That's under the control of a very vicious gang. So um, those two areas basically are, are really, uh, they're, ex they're just controlled by gangs and there's almost no security. Other parts of the country are not so bad. Uh, up, I went to the north on both my visits to Cape Haitian, to Juan Amante and Fort Liberté. Um, I could walk around. I went out at night, went to restaurants. Uh, there's no electricity. There's no running water. The trash doesn't get picked up. So by no means is it great, but you don't have to worry about you're going to get killed by being outside. Uh, in the southern peninsula, similarly, the security situation is, is not nearly as bad as Port-au-Prince, but you have huge issues with access to food because... Port-au-Prince, everything, so much in Haiti, it's so centralized, P things come in, things come out, the commodities, and you have the gangs controlling the port, the main maritime port, hundreds and hundreds of containers are now there, either looted or can't get out, and to the airport. The airport's been closed, it'll be four weeks soon. So for anything to move, usually we'd come into Port-au-Prince and then go out to the countryside, it can't. So outside, even though security is not as bad as it is in Port-au-Prince, everything else in terms of access to food, water, uh, medical supplies. I deal with medical clinics that have uh, presences in the south and the central plateau. They are running out of everything. And staff, their staff, uh, some of them are leaving the country. So number one, job number one in Haiti is reestablishing security in the greater Port-au-Prince area and ideally in the lower Artibonite Valley. Can I ask a follow-up question? Obviously, as you've seen and we've all continually covered, the multinational security support force has had some extensive delays. And so can you help us link, how long can Haitians wait for this force to be deployed? What are your hopes for the multinational security support force? Yes, uh, it, I don't know how much longer Haitians can wait, frankly. Um, I've talked to Haitian colleagues who say um, if, if it's a support it's a support. It's to support the Haitian National Police. That word often gets overlooked. It's not an occupation. It's not MINUSTA 2.0. It's there to help the Haitian National Police. And my colleagues in Haiti will tell me, if this takes much longer, there may not be much of an HNP, a Haitian National Police, to support. So it is more than urgent that, that the force get in there in some way, shape, or form as soon as possible. My hope is that will happen. That's the overwhelming desire. Every Haitian... I, when I was there in the fall, 
uh, I would talk to people from the slum areas, the areas that are controlled by the gangs. They're living through this every day. I couldn't go to them because the UN security rules wouldn't allow me, but they could come to me. They, almost every single one of them had three questions for me. One, where are the Kenyans? They, they use Kenyans for the shorthand for the force. Two, why is it taking so long? That's in November. And three, who was on the sanctions list? They all, they, they want to know who was on the sanctions list. And that's the other thing I would mention, how to get, some, how to get at the gangs and their power. It's the, as the Haitians call it, the, the, the men en cravate, the gang members who have ties. <laughs> They're the ones behind the scenes. They're the ones helping so they've always been involved in some way or another, different degrees of intensity with gangs, either funding them, supplying them with weapons, uh, uh, using them in whatever reasons they have. And the sanctions list, and people don't want to be on that sanctions list. I tell you, I've talked to some business people, and they're very concerned. They lose access to the U.S. financial markets, banks, visas, assets frozen. They don't want it. So I would urge also, and that's again something the Security Council has authorized, uh, the sanctions panel has done fantastic work. Uh, and their names on their list, and I would just urge the Security Council to get those names out there and get these people identified in public. It's, then they're binding on all 103 member, member states. The sanctions, too. And then the third, just to talk about it briefly, is the arms embargo, which again has been authorized by the Security Council. This, it's still, it's incredible to me that weapons and bullets still are going into the gangs, mostly from the United States, either directly or through the DR or Jamaica. There's got to be much, much more vigorous enforcement of the arms embargo by everybody, but certainly the United States, because if the gangs don't have guns or bullets, they lose all their power. Edie? Thank you. I was listening upstairs. <laughs> um, the Transitional Presidential Council is apparently close to formation. It issued its first statement. How important do you see this development and having some kind of a, a governance structure to actually getting the Kenyans and the other uh, police into Haiti and to actually doing something serious to stop the gang violence. I think it's crucial, absolutely vital. Um, I'm hoping last night they issued a, a statement, you probably saw eight of the nine signed it, so they're still the ninth person, but we'll, we'll, they're getting there. Um, and I'm hoping, I heard this morning on Haitian radio, I haven't confirmed it, that they also have announced a timetable. Again, it has to be confirmed that next week after Easter, there would be some inauguration, uh, swearing in at the National Palace, which as I just said, gangs tried to take twice and the Haitian, the Haitian National Police were able to hold them off. Um, so maybe next week we'll see it actually come into formation and, and get active. Uh, the sooner the better, as with the MSS, that's vital. Uh, it's also linked because as you know, uh, President Ruto has said, you know, he's put it on pause because he has to have a Haitian counterpart. Um, uh, Henri is now gone, or he will be resigning as soon as the presidential council is formally uh, created. Uh, he will then have a Haitian counterpart to discuss the deployment. So it's, and it's vital for Haitians because this is the Haitian solution. It's all Haitian and they're gonna be working together. Some people that ver don't agree on very much, frankly, they've been their political rivals for many years. Now they're coming together with a heavy burden. I mean, there's a lot depending on if they can make this work. So I hope it works. I hope it works very quickly and, and get going. Uh, but as anybody who's worked in Haiti knows, nothing is simple or straightforward. It always takes longer than you wish. But every day that goes by, all this work becomes harder, more dangerous, and more expensive, frankly. So I think we've seen the, the price of delay. It's over two years now, uh, 18 months since the first time that came up at the Security Council, the Secretary General uh, asked for a force, then October authorized, and we're still waiting, we're still waiting, and every day lost means more people die, and more women and girls get raped, and more people flee their homes, so the sooner the better. Did you also have a question? No. Huh? Uh, let me go to, uh, to online, to the screen. Let's see, do we have questions from some of the journalists connected on online? I don't see any. Yes, Danny. Uh, yeah, Can I ask yeah. one more, again, on yeah. the multinational security support force? The fund, as we all have talked about numerous times, has not really seen a lot of money coming in recently. What is your message to those who have pledged money but not necessarily transferred it into the account? 
again, please, please. I mean, I remember I worked in Rwanda uh, after the genocide, and I, I got to know General Dallaire. And, um, and I remember an interview he did once during this, when it was all happening, the genocide, and, then, and he said, uh, journalist said, what do you need? And he said, send me troops. You know, what, he said, send me troops. What do you expect me to say? And I feel the same way now with Haiti. Send money. Send troops. Send police. And, you know, get, it, it's just, it's, it's absolutely, again, the, what, all, the, all the cases, that the, the, the trends we've seen, the, 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 num the level of killing, the level of fear. Um, two quotes I just stick in my mind. One Haitian uh, friend of mine uh, said, you know, I, I want to be just poor again. That's a, such a terrible thing, but for him that would be a huge step forward, just be poor again. And I heard a woman being interviewed on the BBC, and she said, life has become death. Life here has become death. So uh, the urgency, I, I can't, I don't know how I can say it any more strongly than I've tried, uh, is vital on all these fronts, the, the force, the money, and the trust fund. I would wish the Republicans in my own country would stop playing games in Congress and release the money that the US has pledged. That's all part of a whole other, <laughs> whole other set of issues. And then, of course, as I said before, the sanctions and the, uh, the arms embargo. And all of those things coming together with the council, getting formed, getting to work, uh, then we maybe change the momentum here. We really could change this. It's gonna be really hard and still gonna take time, but we've been on such a downward slope now for so many months now. And again, the Haitians, the courage they show is unbelievable. I mean, there's a Haitian saying too, if you ask somebody, how, you, how are you today? They'll often say, nula, which means I'm here. And that's an achievement, I'm still here. That's, that, in Haiti nowadays, that is an achievement. You've gotten through another day. And it really shouldn't be, it, that's gotta stop. It's really, it's, it's got way beyond that point. Any other questions? So I think we will end. On these words, uh, thank you so much. First of all, the report, the full report is available online on the website of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that it will be presented in Geneva on Tuesday uh, by Volker Turk, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and William O'Neill. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much for being with us uh, today and for presenting the report, for answering questions. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone, thank you. for being here. <laughs>